what does this painting, this painting, and this painting all have in common? Let's find out on Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. What these three beautiful paintings have in common is that their artists all used artistic license. Here's a picture of my artistic license. I keep it with me at all times. And yes, we're going to use a bit of humor in this presentation. And no aircraft were harmed in the making of this video. But let's have some fun. We're going to look at some artists of the 20th century. We're starting with Bob McCall who began as a commercial artist. You see his work in Life and Look magazines in the mid-1950s, uh, and then he graduated to become a space artist and became the artist in residence for the Apollo Moon Program. But he did a series of ads for TWA when they introduced their new Starstream Boeing 707. And uh, this is a captivating image, and this is another one. But Bob used artistic license. Look at the control tower in the background, and then the TWA terminal. And let's look at an aerial photo of the airport. This is Idlewild Airport in New York. Today, it's JFK. But you see the red dots there showing you the location. And so this, uh, his reference photos were taken from the upper right-hand corner of the photograph out there by Rockaway Boulevard. Well, if that is correct, then his airplane is landing on the departure end of runway 04 right, with about 800 feet usable before he goes into the fence and winds up on the other side of Rockaway Boulevard. But the painting works. So let's talk about the artistic license. It's uh, issued by the Federal Aviation Art Agency and uh, Regulation 39-1, Section 2, Part 5 states that the holder of this certificate is permitted to alter reality in the sole interest of creating more believable visual imagery, which basically means it has to look cool. Currency of this certificate is to be maintained by making five paintings to a full stop every 90 days. Our second artist is the great Wren Wicks. Here's a photo of a younger uh, Wren in the 1940s on the right side there. He's setting up a uh, movie shoot and photo shoot for uh, TWA Constellations. Wren was Howard Hughes's personal artist and illustrated many TWA aircraft. Well, here's the first version of the Lockheed Connie, the 049. And here's the last version of the Connie. This is a elongated uh, aircraft with bigger engines, a longer wingspan. And this was the 1649 Starliner Constellation. Now, I mention this because this airplane had long straight wings, different from the original Connie's, and the engines were moved further outboard to reduce noise and vibration in the cabin. And this is what Hughes wanted to uh, have portrayed in an ad that Wren painted. Well, there's his airplane. Now, you want to talk about artistic license, that airplane has about the same proportions as this airplane, a sailplane. Go figure. The Republic F-105. Uh, this is one of my paintings, and we're going to, uh, I'm sorry, this is a photograph, but we're going to talk about one of my paintings. Uh, this is the first F-105 delivered to the United States Air Force in 1958. And uh, I attended the final retirement of the airplane at Hill Air Force Base in February of 1984. It was called Thud Out. So here's the last F-105 to fly. It's the third of a three-ship formation. Uh, I was uh, flying in a KC-135 tanker, and he had just refueled, and so I got this uh, photo just before the three-ship went back to land for the very last time in history. My painting was called Hail to the Chief, it was a 30 by 40 oil on masonite panel for the Air Force art program, and it hung in the Pentagon for a number of years. Uh, the 30 by 40 painting, quite large, was very detailed and hyper accurate. If anyone who was there wanted to find their car in the parking lot, they could do it. It was that uh, exact. However, this is the version that I photoshopped for use in reproduction, where it would appear smaller. I cleaned up the background and changed the markings on the airplane. And why would I do that? Well, uh, here's the uh, third F-105 that you saw in the tanker photo. Uh, they had ladders around the airplanes, and I researched the 
uh, upper surfaces, and this is exactly what the airplane looked like. Notice that the aileron on the right wing is from a different aircraft. It was all tan. So uh, a number of unusual uh, features in this color scheme, but uh, to make it more believable and easier to read, I repainted it that way. Now, am I changing history? Well, again, it's for the specific use. So the painting as it hung in the Pentagon was exactly what it looked like that day. For reproduction, it's altered to uh, just read a little easier at smaller sizes. Again, artistic license. All right, here's one, D.B. Cooper. Uh, this was uh, Thanksgiving Eve, 1971, uh, the hijacking of a Northwest 727. I've covered this in some other videos, but uh, I did a painting of the hijacking. In actuality, it was a cold and stormy night, pitch black sky, pouring rain. And uh, if you could have seen it at all, it would have looked like this. If you could even see the lights of the airplane. But my painting looked like this. So you can see him jumping. Here's another one. The uh, free flight four, the fourth of five uh, approach and landing tests for the space shuttle Enterprise, the uh, non-orbital space shuttle for flight test. And uh, this was the beginning of a painting called Free Enterprise, showing the launch of that uh, shuttle off the top of this NASA 747. So this is a comp drawing, the first sketch made from models. And uh, I noticed I had a, a, a bit of a problem. Uh, if you look at the right-hand outrigger vertical fin on the tail, it's crossing the intersection of the runways at North Base. And that's a big no-no. You don't want to have uh, intersecting lines. It'll catch the viewer's attention and literally stop the airplane dead and uh, create it from uh, looking like it's flying. So there's the problem right there. Solution, move south base about, oh, 300 yards or so to the east and get that intersection in view. And now the fin overlaps the runway and uh, the airplane is moving again. Well, there it is in the final painting. And I'm showing this to you because I want to make the point, as Jack Len would explain to me, that uh, when someone comes up to the painting, which is in the permanent collection of the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, no one, and I mean no one, is ever going to look at it and say something like, yeah, it's nice, but, you know, uh, it looks like North Base was moved about 300 yards to the east. Mm, I'm not sure I, I like that. Not going to happen. Let's try this one, X-15 landing. Uh, in this case, I'm uh, making a painting of Joe Engel's astronaut wings flight on 29 June 1965. This is the uh, structural engineering drawing of the airplane. And this is what is going to be on the canvas. So let's talk about this. Uh, they used smoke grenades for the X-15 pilots to be able to see the wind from high altitude. So they had different colors for different uh, days. And so on that day of that flight, it was a red smoke grenade. And then, of course, you had the F-104 chase plane, which is critical because the chase pilot calls out the final few hundred feet of altitude. As reference, the uh, X-15 is hard to see out of with the uh, nose at a high angle of attack on landing. And uh, this was the beginning of the testing of the ablative coating for uh, the high-speed flights that would come a few years later. And this was a... Uh, uh, kind of a pencil eraser type uh, material that was uh, sprayed onto the airplane to uh, as a heat sink. It would absorb the extra high heating at Mach 6 or so. And uh, so they were beginning to test this material on the airplane. So let's take a look at what it would have looked like because there were a few little surprises. Number one, there was no wind that day. So the red smoke in a video that uh, Joe Engel showed to me uh, for reference, the smoke was literally going straight up. So that's the first little difference. The second, as I mentioned, the uh, pink ablative coating was uh, being sprayed on the airplane in, in patches. And so it uh, had a, an unusual look to it. And last, the, uh, to the chase plane uh, was way out of position. It was that pilot's first flight with the X-15. He was able to call out the altitudes, but he was nowhere near uh, where it should have been. And so he wasn't even in frame. However, if I painted it like this, 
Uh, would anyone have believed it? No. So I used my artistic license and painted it like this. And what's really ironic, some of the people on the program who saw the painting looked at it and went, oh, yeah, I was there that day. That's exactly what it looked like. Right. Okay, let's talk about model box art. And the phrase that I always use, and this is a family channel, so the polite version is, you've got to be kidding me. And here's what I mean by that. We're going to talk about the godfather of model box art, Jack Lenwood, did 625 uh, box tops for Ravel and Aurora. And um, let's take a look at that helicopter. Get out your calculators. I have a math problem for you. You ready? Okay. If the rotor diameter of a Bell Jet Ranger is roughly 35 feet and the helicopter is one foot off the ground at a 30 degree bank angle, how much of the main rotor blade is going to be in the ground when Jack paints the helicopter? Think about that. So Jack would apply those kinds of tricks to his box art. He worked for Northrop uh, before he uh, got the contract for Ravel. And here we have a Nortronics or Northrop space plane uh, returning to Earth from the moon, which is in actuality 250,000 miles from Earth, unless you're in Jack's strange world where uh, they're 50,000 miles apart to look better in the painting. And he employed that in reverse with this X-15 cover for Ravel, uh, where the uh, orbital X-15 is leaving the Earth for the moon. Uh, and I guess that green color is the ozone layer. I'm not sure, but again, artistic license. Here's one of my favorites. This is the very first cover that Jack painted for Ravel models. It's the Lockheed C-130, and he used Van Nuys Airport for reference. That was the tower at that time. So take a look at this image. Notice that the shadows on the airplane are coming. The, the light source would be from the upper right. As you see there, look at the tower. The light source is from the upper left. Good trick, but it works. All right, basic rule number one for box art, don't ever use dead flat front, rear, plan, or bottom views of an airplane to denote action. Uh, rule number two, you know you've made it in art when you can break all the rules. For instance, here's a dead front view of a Lancaster. And uh, what's he doing there? There's contrails. He's in a kind of a skidding turn. Oh, okay. Uh, the ME-262 is attacking the formation. But look at the position of the two bombers, not even close to being in the same, uh, you know, airspace. And yet you look at the cover and go, oh, wow, sure. Here's another one, rear view of an ME-109. What's this airplane doing? Well, it had just flown right through the middle of that P-51. Or how about this, another ME-109 that flew through two airplanes to get where it is in the image. And of course, I can't show this uh, particular box top without... Uh, giving a shout out to my dear friend Max of Max's Models, the greatest model channel on YouTube. Check it out. Uh, let's talk about murals. This is painting pretty large. And uh, there's a lot of artistic license used in these murals. For instance, the murals are where things that could never, ever happen in real life actually do happen. Let's take a look. This is a Douglas DC-1. It was the prototype for the airplanes that evolved into the DC-3, the legendary uh, twin-engine airliner that revolutionized air travel in the mid-1930s. This airplane could fly 210 miles per hour at 23,000 feet. It was unpressurized, so the service ceiling more, was more like 10 or 12,000 feet. But in the mural, I'm going to place this in formation with a DC-10, to show all the DC airliners, the DC-10 flies at 585 miles per hour at 42,000 feet. So this would be impossible in real life, but we're going to make it happen. And here's how we do it. I'm showing all the DC airliners. So the DC-1, 2, and 3. And then I add the 5, 6, and 7. The DC-4 is uh, over here with the jets. And, of course, I have the DC-8, 9, and 10. Put them all together. And you get a mural called Fly Douglas. This is at the Muse Museum of Flying in Santa Monica, California. One of three murals that I was able to paint at that location. 
But again, completely impossible. And you look at it and hopefully it's a believable image as all the great Douglas airliners fly in formation. And there it is in the museum. It is 10 feet high by 20 feet long. It took six months to paint, about uh, 800 work hours. It was up on a, uh, a lift uh, and it was just a, an amazing project. But again, could never happen in real life and made believable using my artistic license. And uh, finally, the uh, X-Planes at Edwards. This was another mural for the uh, Air Force Flight Test Center Museum at Edwards. And so the objective was to take all the first generation X-Planes and add the uh, more modern X-Planes of the 60s and 70s. I'm, uh, 50s and 60s, I'm sorry. And then, uh, of course, the motherships of all these different aircraft, uh, the chase planes for all these different flights and some additional X-planes, and then put it over the lake bed at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. And what you wind up with is a mural with 40 aircraft total, 16 primary aircraft and then others in the background, plus uh, 12 scenes from the movie Toward the Unknown that are hidden in the image. And you wind up with a mural called The Golden Age of Flight Test, 1947-1977. And there's what it looks like in the museum. So, as we used to say at art school, I went to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, many, many years ago. And uh, this was written uh, on the wall in the men's room, but it said, the visual language, like any language, can be lied in. But sometimes it's better than telling the truth. Or is it? And there you have it. A look at uh, some images in aviation art with uh, a uh, ample usage of artistic license. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. It's a joy to bring these presentations to you. And uh, if you haven't signed up as a subscriber, we'd appreciate having you on board. As always, until next time, take care.